Let's just drop that there. We on? We are. We're on. So welcome guys, we are on, but we've just lost Michael. So just give me a minute and we'll try and get him back before we've got five minutes before we're going to start anyway. So Apparently the internet's not that great down in the boon. In the gong. In the gong, the boondocks. Hey. Welcome back. Had to go back to um. Brody, how are you, man? Good man. Had to go back to the iPad. What do you have, man? Oh, ah, very good. How are you, dude? Yeah, do that thing. Yeah, no kissing, Brady. No, no, it's all it's all about COVID love at the moment. <laughs> it's well known I'm a hugger. I'm struggling, man. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think I can actually do a Christmas in this joint and not hug anyone. It's, it's going to be very, very sad if it's not <laughs> over by then. So, welcome, guys. For you, you uh, that are just joining us, we've got a few minutes before we'll start, but pretty excited for this tasting. So, um, tasting some amazing, obviously, some amazing whiskies. Um, I don't think I've actually, I've only tried two of these, so. Yeah, is, um, I've not tried a lot of them, though. Yeah, <coughs> so. Um, yeah. yeah, I haven't, yeah. I haven't tried the 25 to 30 yet either, so I'm pretty excited. <laughs> yeah, Have absolutely. So. This was a purely selfish decision <laughs> on our part. What yeah. <laughs> we try? How can we indulge ourselves? I had to turn into it. something different for a change. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> so. Uh, it's not often you get to try whiskey of this caliber, and it's uh, it's an awesome opportunity. I think the one that I'm looking forward to the most is the Ian Hunter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the empty bottle smells good, man. <laughs> yeah, there was um, it's a pretty strong smell when we were bottling them all. That was that's for sure. Six um, big whiskies and yeah, all open up and. Yeah, poured out on the kitchen table. It's pretty good. Uh, uh, should be good night. Yeah, so again, thank you for all this. Oh, bye, Michael. Uh, no, it's, um, yeah, very, <laughs> very lucky. Very, very lucky to obviously be um, sort of running through with this. So just, Cam, while we're waiting, um, what, um, what order are we going in? Yeah, guys, so we're going to do... Um... Our Japanese whiskey first, then finish with our, our Lafroig or our Isla whiskey. Um, so we're going to do the Hakushu 18 first, followed by the Yamazaki 18, and then the Habiki 17. Uh, then we'll jump across to Scotland to Isla, and we'll do in, in uh, order of age, we'll do the 25, the 27, then the Ian Hunter 30. Excellent. Yeah. I must say, Michael, we don't often see a Lafroig two year old. Two? Yeah. No, definitely not. No, just right, right there in front of you. All oh, right, there we go. Fifty-two year old. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, mate. You're a couple of years off. <laughs> Only just. Hey, it's actually funny. Uh, we had a, I had a message from um, our friend, Mr. Dan Woolley, um, the highway man now. So it used to be Mr. Lafroy, now it's the highway man. Um, basically, turned saying that he would love to have been involved with this one, and he reckons that the Lafroy will smash. The Japanese out of the park. <laughs> uh, it'll be interesting to see what everyone thinks of them, and some everyone's going to have their own favourites, yeah, which yeah. is yeah the best thing about it. I am completely impartial, Isla. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I had a bit of fly in my throat. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, very good. We'll give a couple more minutes just while people are coming on. Uh, there's yeah, quite a few people coming on now. I said we do have a few people that have uh, bought the kits, and um, we'll, yeah, we'll be watching at a later date. So um, yeah, if there is anyone still watching, I think I've got two, maybe three kits left now. So yeah, of this one. So, so yeah. is that when we down turn mute it, John, so that way the people who are doing it later can't actually listen to it. 
Oh, it's up to them not to get on, I guess. <laughs> it's like watching the football score, isn't it? You're not going to sort of, yeah, got to try and distance yourself and not watch. I manage not to watch football. Yeah, yeah, yeah you do quite a lot, actually. That. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so those of you, have, I think you've probably uh, met Michael before and Cam. Cam's done a few of these with us as well. And obviously myself, John and Brady. Uh, we're sitting in Liquor Legends in Charnwood at the moment. So Michael's down in Wollongong. And where are you, Cam? Uh, in Sydney. Sydney. So. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for having us again. Uh, I think this is our sixth that we've been involved in. It'd be six or seven. We've, been, we've done gins and whiskies and bourbons yeah. and, yeah. All sorts. Uh, so, no, again, guys, thank you very much for the opportunity to to showcase some of these awesome whiskies that we've got to play with um, yeah. and be able to have a few bottles for sale as well, which is probably even the, the more so the, uh, the rarity outside of tasting them is actually having them up behind you, um, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, er er everything we're tasting today, we do. Um, yeah, we do have. So we, mm -hmm. yeah, we have it for sale. So it's um, yeah. Ready to go. Um, well, look, we've got 15 people on board. As I said, we do have a few people that are um, watching together and also going to be watching at a later date. So given that it's just after 7.30 and um, yeah, I think we'll be right to go. So just quickly again, uh, I'm John. This is Brady. We're at Liquor Legends Charnwood at the moment. Uh, we've got Michael Thomas from the Exchange and Cam Pirrett from the Exchange as well. So yeah, very excited for this one. This one's had a lot of... Um, a lot of people very excited about it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll let the whiskies do the talking, I guess. I'm pretty excited to get into it. So, I, I did love your little um, video about um, the age of whiskies. I think that someone borrowed that from something that happened. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was some serendipity involved. No. <laughs> what was it? We worked out 135 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, whiskey sort of in front of in barrel in front of us. So. And if that's you exclude right. Michael, that's older than the th four of us. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> All right, Cam, take it away, my friend. Uh, guys, awesome. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here again doing uh, another uh, masterclass. Uh, this one for me is uh, very, very special. Probably one of the better masterclasses I've ever done in my, in my time as ambassador with the group. Um, I'm excited tonight. I've only tried four of the six, so two of them are a treat for me as well. And, and as you guys can see, we've got an immensely awesome lineup. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at our, our Japanese first and then finish with our Isla Isla Lafroig. Um, the reason being is that Lafroig could be pretty intense. We don't want to blow away our palates. We'll, we'll do the Japanese and build into it. Um, so what I thought we might do is we'll have a little chat around both those regions first and we'll jump in and, and try our whiskey. So in terms of the Japanese, what we're going to do, I mean, in case you missed this, we're going to start with the Hakushu. Then we'll do the Yamazaki, um, and then we'll do the Hibiki 17. So I thought we might have a little look at the, the House of Suntory and the, the history of Japanese whiskey. Um, so Suntory was started by Shinjiro Tori um, at the time back at the beginning of um, the 20th century or the early 1900s. He founded Suntory in, in 1909, and basically what he did, or sorry, 1899, and basically what he was doing was at the time he was a trader. So he was going and um, importing ports and wines and sherries and bringing them back, um, re-bottling them, re-labeling them, cutting them with sugars and, and juices and stuff to make it more palatable, uh, more sweet, um, and more uh, suitable to the Japanese palate. Um, at the time, Japan had, had just been through a, a period of sort of an isolationist foreign policy. And when they'd opened up um, to, the, to the rest of the world, they became super obsessed with the West, um, in particular British culture as well. Um, the Japanese gentleman wanted to drink like the British um, wear three-piece suits. There's a big obsession with Western culture. But the thing is, at the time, um, in the, the British, I guess, um, tea rooms and bars and stuff, what they were drinking was, was scotch, blended scotch. Um, and, and it was quite smoky back in the time, quite heavily peated. Um, and that just didn't sit with the Japanese palate. It was, it was really, really intense. Um, Japan already had a rich history of, of distillation and fermentation. They already did beer, sake, um, soju, uh, soy, they, they, they already had plenty of um, brewing and distilling happening in the country, but they just hadn't really mastered or, or got to doing whiskey yet. So Tori wanted to do that. He wanted to do something um, super 
um, parallel to the Japanese market and something specific to Japan. So they wanted to make whiskey. Um, being a trader, he didn't have a strong background in that. So he partnered with a man who had the same sort of dream in the name of Masataka Takasuru. Um, and in 1913, Takasuru went over to Scotland and started trading. Um, he worked at places like Longmorn, Springbank, some fairly famous Scottish distilleries, um, and really learned his craft and learned off the Scottish and how to hone um, single malt and, and, and Scottish, oh, sorry, Scottish whiskey making that he could bring back and turn into Japanese, Japanese whiskey. Um, so he came back after 10 years, married a Scottish lass, came back. Um, and in 1923, they opened the first ever Japanese whiskey distillery in Yamazaki. Uh, with that, guys, um, basically they had a little bit of a falling out. Um, Takasuru had really loved um, what he'd learned in Scotland, and he kind of wanted to more replicate the Scottish style, wanted to make the distillery in a different location. Um, but he had a 10-year contract. And being an honorable businessman, he worked that contract to the day. And in 1933, Takasuru moved up and opened Yoichi Distillery up in the top of Japan in Sapporo. Um, and Yoichi is the first of the Nika distilleries. So you can see between um, Tori and Takasuru, these guys really are um, the, the godfathers of, of Japanese whiskey. Uh, so we started in, in 1923 in Yamazaki uh, and, and had some success in 1937 with Kakabe, which was released. Um, still the most biggest drunk whiskey in Japan today. It comes in everything from 50 mil bottles all the way up to 1.5 litre or four and a half litre bottles even. Um, super popular. They love drinking it in bars, at dinner, um, in highballs, or even just meat. Um, and yeah, so the, the Japanese people have become super obsessed with it. Uh, the reason for Kakabin being the first successful release they did was um, it was the first unpeated blended malt. So still had that lovely malt taste, um, but a bit softer for that Japanese palate. Didn't have any of that heavily peated stuff in there. So really, really successful. Um, if we fast forward to 1973, um, to celebrate 50 years of Japanese whiskey distilling, we opened Hakushu, which is our, our second distillery. Um, now, with the Hakushu, uh, we did this time go back and do a, a slightly peated whiskey. It's definitely not heavy. It's nothing like the Islas we're going to try later, but it does have a little bit of that smoke flavor there. Um, and it's more of our Alpine distillery up in the Japanese Alps, so a lot fresher and cleaner style of whiskey. Um, and then in 1989, uh, we launched Hibiki to celebrate 90 years of, of the House of Suntory or the Suntory Company. Um, and that was our first blended whiskey. Um, we'd opened Cheetah in 1972, pretty close to the same time we did Hakushu, and that was our grain spirit. So it really gave us a chance to, to play in the, in the blended category. So that's kind of, a, I guess, a, a quick summary of, of the history of, of Japan and some of these um, distilleries we're going to look at today. So the two distilleries and then the, the blended whiskey we're going to look at from Japan. Um, I guess before we sort of, because we're doing a bit of a comparison between the two types of whiskeys tonight, one of the key differences in, in the process with Japanese whiskey is um, to make whiskey, we take our, our barley, um, we malt it, we then crush it and cook it with hot water. Um, we ferment it with yeast, um, and that gets us to about 10% alcohol. So we kind of essentially have an unhopped beer that the distillery makes. Um, then we double distill in, in copper pot stills, and then we age in barrels. Now that process is the same in both these areas of the world. Um, Japanese whiskey is often always seen as um, a bit lighter, a bit cleaner, a little bit sweeter. Um, and there is a, a big difference in the process that kind of leads to this. Uh, what will happen in Scotland is once you've made um, your, your wash and you've fermented it and you've kind of essentially got your beer, um, it goes into the still with all the leftover um, chunks of sort of barley and yeast and everything like that. And it, and it goes in quite heavy in texture. Um, in Japan, they take their beer that they've made at the distillery or their wash and they actually, um, they clarify that, they strain it out, get rid of all the leftover yeast. And so almost like if you're thinking, I guess if you want to think of it in terms of like the Scottish are throwing like a really heavy double IPA into their still to make their whiskey and the Japanese are throwing a super crisp clean lager, um, the liquid they're distilling is a lot lighter in texture already and a lot more clarified. So that, that means they're not trading any complexity, but they're getting a lot lighter, a lot more refined spirit. So with that, guys, let's jump in and have a look at, at our first one tonight. Um, so as I said, we're going to have a look at Hakushu, um, the 18-year-old. Um, as I said, beautiful Alpine distillery, about two and a half hours west of Tokyo, up in the Alps. Um, and because of that, um, lovely, fresh, green, vibrant flavors that we, we associate with Hakushu Distillery. Um, one of the cool things about Hakushu as well is when it comes to their still, they're one of the only distilleries around that are still using um, direct fired stills. So rather than using steam created through either gas or electricity, um, they're still using direct fired stills. So directly heating that still up with a flame. What that will do is it kind of gives a caramelized sweetness to the, 
to the vapor as it starts to head off out of the still. Um, it's a little harder con to control because you've kind of got an instant hit of heat coming to the bottom of that still, but it does leave you like a sort of extra hit of sweetness and lightness um, to your whiskey. Um, so we've got about five different stills there at Hakushu making um, some different styles of, of that uh, whiskey that we put back together. Uh, and it is, as I said, a lighter style. I mentioned as well, Hakushu is our, our peated distillery. So there is a bit of peat there. Now we measure peat in parts per million and I'll go into peat a little bit more when we jump across to Isla where it's the most famous smoky whiskey place in the world. But um, the peat we're looking at today is, is not the 40 parts per million we're going to look at with Lafroy. It's, it's five parts, five to seven parts per million. So very, very, very soft um, smoke. Now what you'll find with that peat is the peat is part of the distillery characteristic. Um, so the more time you spend in barrel, the softer it, it, it generally gets. Um, but what we do across the Hakushi range is our older whiskies are more heavily peated. So they're always five to seven is the range of smoke that we get in the bottle, in the actual glass when we pour it. So it means whether you have a distiller's reserve Hakushu or a 12 or an 18 or a 25, the level of smoke you get on the nose when you enjoy this whiskey should be about the same. Uh, so let's dive in and have a try, guys. I, I jumped the gun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Cam, you guys already the, started uh, without me. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we started. Yeah. I figured that might be the case. <laughs> I was listening. We're, we're no, 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 that's all good. <laughs> um, yeah, guys, uh, please, by all means, go at your own pace. Um, maybe not so much for the Japanese. I mean, it's up to you if you want. Um, but I would recommend maybe having a bit of water with you for the tasting, particularly when we get to the car straight for Floyd. A bit of water will open those up if you feel they're too strong. Uh, when so it Cam, comes to the, tasting... Cam, yeah? Sorry, bro. Just the, the, uh, the peat. Um, where does that come from for, for Hakushu? Yeah, so with Hakushu, what we're actually doing is we're buying the barley from Scotland already, already peated. Um, so we're buying pre-peated, pre-malted barley to make, to make our whiskey. Um, I mean, essentially, you could um, use Japanese peat um, and you could malt in Japan and peat in Japan. Um, these processes generally, like where a barley is malted um, and where a barley is, is peated doesn't have too much um, of an effect on the whiskey. Um, I should say as well as it's not, it's not an Isla style peat. It's not that big seaside iodine, salty seaweed style smoke that you get in the Lafroig. This is a mainland Scottish peat that we use um, from up in the Highlands. So it's much more of a earthy, mossy, floral sort of lighter style of smoke. Um, when it comes to peat, it is very important where that actual peat comes from. So uh, even though we're smoking it to a lesser degree, um, the softness we're getting is also from the fact that it's a much softer style of smoke that we're smoking it with. So guys, on the nose, you should find it's very, very vibrant and green. You might get like uh, pear, apple, um, almost like for me, kind of like crunchy red apples and, and fresh pear. There's a little bit of, think like dried mint or oregano, maybe even a bit of rosemary. There's sort of that herbaceousness there on the nose. And there's a little bit of sort of menthol coming through as well. That's that sort of little bit of peat iodine starting to flick through and mix with that sort of mint and that vibrancy. A little bit of pine coming through as well. On the palate, I get sort of beautiful fresh mango comes through. It's quite fruity. Um, and then there's a little bit of spice and I guess sort of honey and caramel on the finish, but, but really clean. And then when you breathe out, you get a little bit of that sort of soft smoke coming back through as well. Um, when it comes to drinking your whiskey, guys, you should do it responsibly, but any way you please. Uh, as long as you're enjoying it, I'm happy with that. But um, if you are wanting to sort of get some procedure around tasting something new, you definitely want to start with your smell. Try and breathe in through your, your nose and your mouth kind of at the same time. Get that, that air going across your soft palate. Um, unless you're an amphibian, you need air to sort of pick up those flavors um, that go through your nose and connect to the back of your palate. Um, and then when you take it into your mouth and, and swallow it, try and almost... Swish it around a little, get into all the crevices of your mouth, particularly around your tongue, see where it sits. Um, essentially with the nose, you're looking a little for the most of flavors coming in the smell. And then when you go over your palate, that's where you pick up things like sweetness, bitterness, weight, smoke, all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> I like that's that. Crazy. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. It's beautiful, yeah? Quite, yeah, quite happily drink that <laughs> often. <laughs> so, John, I think, when, uh, you're in Japan, when you were in Japan um, the other year, did you actually get get to go to the Hakushu Distillery, or did you only go to Yamazaki? No, we went to Yamazaki. Yeah, so. Hakushu is a little trickier to get to, depending on the season. Sometimes uh, it's quite cold up there, and it freezes over the train tracks and stuff like that. So it's a bit of a mission to get to. 
Once again, I'm the only guy that hasn't been to this place. Same thing. Same thing. Don't worry. Well, you I'm, haven't done I'm, it. No. They haven't, they haven't been allowed to go yet. <laughs> oh, poor Michael. Uh, um, unfortunately, <laughs> I think we were going this year, but that doesn't look like it's going to happen yeah, anytime soon. So, yeah. yeah, yeah thanks, yeah. COVID. Yeah. Thanks, thank you very much, COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> So guys, I think um, as the boy said, I'm, I'm playing catch up, so we might just go straight across and, and have a little taste of the Yamazaki 18. Um, Yamazaki, as I said, our first distillery established in uh, 1923. This is a completely unpeated distillery. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about the complexity of uh, your Yamazaki is when they started the distillery in 1923, as I said, blended with your or blended malts were really popular at the time. Now. You can't make a blended malt in Japan because you don't have any neighbours making whiskey. In Scotland, you just go throw a stone and go knock on your neighbour's door and trade and borrow barrels. And that's how the Scottish get that complexity into their whiskey, by trading with their neighbours at the time. Um, they didn't have that option in Japan. So what they did is stills often work in pairs. We talk about how they're double distilled. So you'll generally have, like, they work in pairs, so your first still and your second still. Now, if we take a distillery, uh, much like Lafroy, They've got three pairs, but they're all identical pairs. Uh, in Japan, we have eight different um, and soon to be 16 different pairs of stills. Um, and each different sort of shape and size of still gives you a slightly different flavor. They're all very reminiscent of Yamazaki, but um, slightly different. Some a bit more fruity, some a bit more floral, some a bit more spicy that come out of the whiskey, so the new make spirit that comes out of that. And then we put that all back together before we um, mature and age that spirit. What that means is we're getting a similar level of complexity as some of your blended malts from Scotland. So that's why Japanese whiskey, even though it's lighter and sweeter, has this amazing complexity to it because of the, the variation and number of stills that each of these distilleries has. Um, so obviously there's a limited amount of, of distilleries in Japan compared to Scotland, but when you see the complexity and, and variation of these whiskies, um, super, super awesome. Um, tonight as well, we're approaching the first of our whiskies that has a bit of Mizunara in it or Japanese white oak. Um, so beautiful um, Pacific wood to Japan that gives amazing flavors of sandalwood, rose and, and leather and tar. And it's, it's super heavy and super intense. Um, it takes us a while to age in that, in that barrel. We get to use it a few times at least. We can use Mizunara um, third, fourth and fifth fill and it's still good, but gives it a really uniquely Japanese flavor. Um, all of our uh, single malt whiskey um, have a little bit of... Um, American Oak X Bourbon, American Oak X Bourbon Quarter Cast, um, some giant 900 litre American Oak um, Virgin Punchins, uh, and they all have a little bit of sherry as well, Oloroso sherry um, first fill in there as well, so some Spanish oak. Uh, that's kind of the four barrels that go into all of our, our age statement um, whiskeys from the House of Suntory, but then with the Yamazaki age statement, so 12 and up, um, there's a lovely bit of Mizunara in there as well, so making it truly Japanese, and that's kind of Mizunara is super rare these days and it's really he heavily regulated by the government. Um, how much we can take of the 1.2 million barrels we fill every year, I think about 100 of Mizunara anyway, or brand new Mizunara. So it really is one of the limiting factors that, and, and one of the reasons that your age statement Japanese is, is quite expensive. But um, none of that used at Hakushu. Uh, that smoke probably makes the, the sandalwood notes and the, the leather and stuff you get from, from that Japanese white oak a little redundant, but definitely in the age statement Yamazaki. So... So, Cam, just Me talking the... about the Mizunara, just quickly, um, when Mike came out for the, the launch of the Mizunara Yamazaki cask, he was talking about the actual time it takes to mature uh, Mizunara trees, roughly around about 350 years. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's about 350 years, as in compared to if you look at an American oak tree that we use for our bourbon barrels, um, you're looking at like 75 to 90 years. Um, sherry, again, like Spanish oak, um, it's a little longer again. It's more that 120 to 150. Um, but yeah, Mizunara is 350. Um, and the wood's really hard to work with as well. Um, they can't, they got to kind of hand cut it. They kind of throw it through band saws because it cracks and splits really easily. So it's, it's really sort of but... interesting as well. It, it, it's not a together, it's very, very knotty. Hey, John, I've got one question for you. Um, yeah. It's from a friend of ours asking you uh, Was your host at Yamazaki, um, did he look after you? Yeah, he looked after us very well. Yeah, very, very good. There you go, Pete. One for you, mate. <laughs> we, while we're on that as well, so um, Drew mentions as well that he might be drinking his Yamazaki out of a Yamazaki whiskey glass that he also got in the distillery. So oh, someone else. Ah, very nice. Someone very nice. And he just wants you to know it's well worth it. Oh, yeah. very good. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. 
So guys, great, great if you go to Japan, done. I absolutely recommend going to the distillery. But if you do plan on going, make sure you, you're organized about it because I think it's booked out usually for at least two to three months in advance. So if you are planning a Japan trip in like the year 2023 or something, um, yeah. <laughs> Brady, I'll just take the knife out of my back and yours at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Uh, so guys, let's, let's keep uh, going along talking about that Mizunara to the, the Habiki 17 year old. Uh, so basically in 1980, they came to the guys and they said, now that we've got Cheetah, which is our grain distillery, so Cheetah making um, column distilled whiskey, so a lot lighter, a lot cleaner, uh, made with 100% corn as well. Um, it's, it's really, it's, we use it much like blended whiskey around the world. That grain whiskey is kind of the canvas and then we take our single malts and blend on top. So our Habiki is an equal portion of Yamazaki, Hakushu, and Cheetah whiskey. Uh, and so these beautiful whiskeys come together to make our blender whiskey. Um, the Japanese are the masters of blending. Um, they call it Sakure Wake. It's actually a word in Japanese that means whiskey blending. So um, they absolutely the masters of blender whiskey. Um, and with the Habiki, they came to them in 1980. And so we want to do a really special release for 1989 to celebrate 90 years of, of the House of Suntory. Uh, and basically... They said to him, we want to see something that the rest of the world has never tried or tasted before. And the guy said, okay, that's easier said than done. What are we going to do? So like all blenders, they just started kicking over all the barrels in the, in the warehouse of the Yamazaki and just looking to see what they had on hand. Um, and they went back and had a look at some barrels from, that were filled sort of in like the 1950s, 1940s. Um, what happened during the Second World War is the distillery kept making still plenty of whiskey. Um, for obvious reasons, during the Second World War, very hard to get American oak barrels or ex bourbon barrels. So they looked for alternative wood source to, to age their whiskey. And what they came across was, was Mizunara or Japanese white oak. So they filled these barrels um, at the start of the 1940s. And then when they came back and looked at the Mizunara barrels five years in, eight years in, they'd seen that nothing had happened. And they said, it's too knotty, it's too tight, it's not good for making whiskey. These barrels are, are useless. So then when they came back about 33 to 35 years later to make Kabiki, and they found these barrels that said Mizunara sitting in, in the warehouses. And they opened them up. The liquid in there was delicious. It was jet black. It was fully intense. Full of those flavors I mentioned before. And what they realized is it takes 15 to realistically more like 18 to 21 years for a Mizunara barrel to hit its strap. It takes that long for that flavor to get in. The good news, as I said, is we get to use a barrel three or four times because of how tight that grain structure is. But it does mean we have to be super, super patient with it. Um, and so for that reason, we do have a bit of Mizunara going into originally started in Habiki and then now it's put in the Yamazaki as well. But only in the age statement stuff in the Yamazaki and Habiki we find a little bit of Mizunara um, giving that beautiful flavor. Now with the Habiki guys, also as well as when we re-blend that together, we give it a little bit of a season in Umeshuka, which is like a Japanese plum wine. Now when it's plum, it's quite tart. It's like a native plum to Japan, so it's really, really tart. Um, and quite almost like chewy in flavor and, and really ripe. Uh, and they make a wine. So we finish it in those casks a little bit as well. So Cam, just a question for you. So the normal Hibiki Harmony, they use approximately around 30 casks to, uh, to actually make Hibiki Harmony. We've got a 24-sided bottle representing the 24 seasons of the day and the 24 hours in the day for the Japanese. Is there any difference to the 17 other than its age? The di yeah, apart the only difference to the age is that Umeshu cast finishing, so that doesn't happen on the Harmony. Um, and then as well, the Harmony doesn't have any of the, the, the Mizunara flowing through it either. So the Mizunara is reserved um, strictly for the age statement stuff. Um, and then even further to that in the Habiki, the Umeshu cast finishing, again, is only for the, the age statement stuff. If you do, I mean, again, no one's doing any international travel, but the Masters Select that you might have seen around that was reserved for um, traveler retail, global traveler retail. Um, that was essentially the same age as the Harmony, but it had been finished with a bit of that Umeshu cast and had a bit of that Mizunara wood in it. So that was sort of the That's exception. The cool. Yeah. Um, so this one, I think the Habiki for most people is probably the favorite of their Japanese whiskey just because it encompasses all the things you love. It, it gets those deep fruits and, and spices and coffees and chocolates from the aged Yamazaki, but it also gets that fresh greenness as well. So for me on the nose, I get lovely sort of like lychee and rosemary and it's quite golden. And then when you dive in, you start to get some lovely sort of like cinnamons and caramels in terms of the spice. 
little bit of pepper in there as well. This lovely sort of pineapple. It's quite robust. Uh, really, really delicious. Heaps, heaps of fruit for the middle there. Very sort of candied finish as well with that, that enmeshing cup. Okay, so Cam, one question for you. The elephant in the room. Yeah. Rumor has it that 17's done. What's it's going done, on? Yeah. Yeah, so the deal is uh, the 17 is, is no longer produced at the distillery. Um, but obviously, there's a bit of a lag time in terms of um, it's still, you know, there's still some to be bottled at the bottling plant. Um, there's still some being shipped to countries around the world. There's still some available on secondary markets. Um, we're lucky. I mean, we're not lucky that we get things a bit delayed in Australia, but because of the way we're delayed, um, there is a little bit floating around till the very end of the year that we're still selling. But uh, pretty much as of 2021, um, yeah, gone. But it'll come back eventually, I think. But uh, when that is, I have no idea. Um, there is there is no truth to the myth that we have plenty of whiskey and we release it slowly because we're trying to make more money. Um, we're just running out of whiskey real quick. So. Hey, Mike, I think the biggest problem is, is that we all love it. Yeah, we, we made, loves it. Yeah, we to uh, Japan, Michael. But what year was that straight Mizunara we tried in Sydney? What year was that? Was it a what are we now? Twenty twenty. So twenty. Sorry, twenty seventeen. Yeah, no, but the the, the whiskey was it a sixty nine? Sixty nine. So actually, something that was actually older than me. Yeah, and that was amazing. So we were very very lucky, Cam. So when Mike came over and they, they were doing the Mizunara launch. He had a little, very, very small vial of uh, uh, the original Mizanara liquid. <laughs> he actually turned, taken it out of the cast the, that week before he came over, um, and there was only a very, very small amount of it left. And he went, "Guys, you seem very interested in what we have." Uh, <laughs> and he actually pulled this little bottle out and gave us all a thing. He said, "Oh, when I get back, this is so oaky. We're going to put an axe through it. That's no good." And we just went. Please don't. Please don't. Um, oh, no. He said it was, it was good to blend, but it yeah. was pretty much undrinkable as opposed to Michael and I that are tapping everyone on the shoulder going, you don't like we'll that. Have that. We'll have that. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. like I, I did, Hef didn't like it, so we just went, I'll fight you over it. Yeah, pretty much. It was, it was like <laughs> bite out of a tree. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. awesome. um, so awesome. I guess to throw it back to you guys. What, what was your favorite of the three, three Japanese so far? All of them. All of them. <laughs> if, if, I, if I had to choose the Hakushu, yeah, I really dug yeah. that. I was a big fan of both of those as well, actually, the Hakushu or the Yamazaki, but probably probably Hakushu, to be honest. So, yeah. That Yamazaki for an 18 year old is just so clean. It's almost, I think some of the whiskey writers are like, it's a bit too perfect. You know, it's just, there's no rough edges to it. It's just sort of like a little bit of chocolate and coffee on the finish. There's plenty of cherry in there, some sticky dates, and a little bit of spice and orange peel, like it's, it's just really clean single malt whiskey. I'm, I'm with you guys. I like I like the, the little bit of the, the freshness and the smoke of the Hakushu. Mm. What about everyone at home? If we haven't got anyone commenting at much, actually saying um, what their favourites were, so they're too busy being impressed. <laughs> too, too busy drinking. <laughs> so, guys, what we'll do is we'll we'll jump across and and have a look at, at um, one of the most famous single malts in the world in in Lafroig. Uh, we always say no one thinks they've tried Lafroig. You know if you've tried it. Um, so Lafroig, obviously coming from, from Isla in Scotland, so one of the six regions. Uh, Isla being its own region because of how many distilleries, um, nine, soon to be ten operating distilleries on this little island. Um, and, they're, and they're famous for doing really, really heavily peated whiskey. Now, the reason behind this is little island, no trees. Before gas and electricity, the guys had to power their homes and heat them. They had to be able to cook their food, um, preserve their fish and their meat. Uh, by smoking it, uh, but obviously fire their stills to make their whiskey. So the fuel source they used was peat. Now what peat is, is it's a decaying organic matter that lives about two foot to nine foot below the surface. Uh, we dig it up like a wet mud and we dry it out. It becomes like a really crumbly dirt, almost like a cow patty, it's like it sort of falls apart. Uh, but what it is, is it's an epic fuel source for putting on a fire. It releases plumes of jet black smoke. Um, and the important thing about peat is it is actually a snapshot of what was there thousands of years ago. So not only are we getting, people often say the flavor is smoke. And yeah, the flavor is smoke, 100%. But the flavors we pick up from that smoke because of the seaside location on those islands is, you can imagine it would have been seaweed, dead fish, sea logs and stuff like that that make up that that um, that peat that we've got. So it's very like salty, sweet, iodine, briny. Um, it really is like a mixture of like sort of driftwood and, and seaweed and 
and sports tape and all these weird things that you wouldn't think sound delicious to put in your mouth, but it, it works amazingly. Um, and for those of us who get hooked to that flavor, we kind of want nothing more. So absolutely beautiful. Um, and then, as I said, Isla Lafroig is, is one of the most famous Isla whiskeys out there. Um, super recognizable flavor. Um, we started in 1815. Uh, and Lafroig actually means Broad Hollow by the Bay, which is the name of the place uh, where Lafroig is built. And we look, we use the Kilbride Dream as our, as our water source. So beautiful distillery there and, and just embodies everything that is, um, is Isla and is Pete. Um, we get all our ex-bourbon barrels from, from Maker's Mark. Um, so we're getting the best quality wood as well and, and just a really phenomenal whiskey. Um, we have a special club called the, the Friends of Lafroig that every time you buy a bottle of Lafroig, you get your little passport. You can own a square foot of land at the distillery there. Um, and when you go there, they'll give you galoshes and a GPS tracker and you can track out um, and stand on your square foot of land and, and then you can come back and claim your rent, which is, of course, um, delicious, delicious whiskey. So we're going to look at some really special ones tonight, guys. Um, some of the, the more modern releases, I guess. Um, and obviously some quite older Lafroigs. Um, I think the beautiful thing about the age Lafroigs is, don't get me wrong, it's still going to taste that classic, classic um, Lafroig peat and that, that smoke that we all know and love. Um, and it's, it's still peated to 40 parts per million, but it's going to come across a little softer with that extra barrel, and that extra age that, that's rolling through there. Um, so the first one we're going to look at tonight, guys, is um, the 2019 25-year-old, which is actually a car strength 25-year-old. Um, this one's a combination of two types of barrels, um, and it's a double maturation. So essentially, it spends 18 years in American oak ex bourbon barrel first fill, um, and then it spends about seven or spends seven years in um, Spanish oak Oloroso sherry refill barrels as well. So you are going to get a little bit of sherry flavour coming through, some of those more um, dried fruits, um, and a little bit of spice on the finish as well. Um, but you're also going to get that big sort of like vanilla, um, bit of sort of like lemon. Uh, lemon peel, uh, and then that lovely smoke coming through that we generally associate that sort of citrus and sweetness, um, and then and then smoke that is classic for Freud and, and it's coming from those bourbon barrels. <clears throat> Sorry, can I just have a moment? I was just going to say, is it time to light up a cigar? <laughs> uh, again, on. guys, hang on. <laughs> Uh, so, guys, 51.4%. All the Lafroigs here are, are non-chill filtered. Um, for someone, anyone who's ever wondered what that means is basically um, when, we, when we distill our whiskey and it comes out of the barrel and we cut it with our water, um, essentially there's some larger sort of proteins in, or, or molecules in the whiskey that when they get colder, they group together. They become non-soluble in water. Um, what we can do when we chill filter is we, we chill the whiskey down and group those together and filter those out. Um, it's not better or worse. I mean, whiskey purists will say that you, you're losing flavor. And I mean, that stands to reason. If you're taking something out in the filtration process, you probably are. And those flavors are probably some of the bigger, heavier flavors. Um, but then some of the people who enjoy lighter whiskey um, don't mind it being chill filtered, think it softens it out. What will definitely happen though is with these whiskeys, because they're non-chill filtered, if you put them on ice, um, or chill them down. They might go a little bit cloudy. Definitely not a defect in the whiskey. It's something that happens to all your higher proof um, non-chill filter whiskey. Um, those bigger proteins come together and they give the whiskey a cloudy texture. In terms of that though, with your non-chill filtered, if you're just adding some tepid or, or slightly above room temperature or slightly below room temperature water, I should say, definitely not going to harm the whiskey at all. It will definitely open it up. So particularly with these little eggs, I would recommend to everyone have a little taste of it neat, and then maybe if you pick a bit strong, add a splash of water, you're definitely not going to harm the whiskey. Um, I mean, if we look at a car strength whiskey, the only way we get it to 40% of the distillery is just by adding more water to it. So um, adding water to your whiskey is definitely a way to, to change the flavor of it. It's almost a, akin to decanting a wine. Um, like if you've got a really heavy red and you need to open it up, water's going to be a similar thing for that whiskey. It's going to make it more palatable, bring out more flavor for you, make it nice and soft. So Brady, welcome home. I know, right? So, oh. just so just quickly on that before we jump straight on to the Lafroy. So, definitely Hikashi was the winner there. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the comments coming through, everybody loving that. Um, but then, as soon as people have opened this up, we're getting, yeah, loved it all. But let's see how the PD ones go. The smell alone is amazing. Um, yeah, and all fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I think the big difference with those those types of peat is. The Hakushu kind of, you drink it 
And then it's when you breathe out, you feel that smoke coming through from like the, almost the depth of like um, your stomach and the back of your throat. It kind of comes back out nice and soft. Whereas the Lafroy, as soon as your nose gets even close to it, you can smell that iodine um, and that sort of uh, chemical feel coming through and then that big puff of smoke. And then as you go further in, you get a bit of sort of like a little bit of that sweetness, almost like there's a bit of caramel molasses coming through there, a bit of maple syrup almost in terms of sweetness. Um, definitely plenty of like candied orange peel. Hey, Cam, it's like a bell curve. The older it gets, the the less it it's intense. Um, where like if you turn with put a 10 up against the 25, the 10 is going to be out of the world. Um, Way smokier, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've come off Japanese whiskey, so this seems fairly intense. But if you did have some Lafroy floating around and you were to grab like a 10 year old um, and try it against the 25, you're going to find the 10 year old is much smokier, much more intense. Um, basically, as, as Mike was alluding to, is the smoke or the peat, um, it sits as part of the distillery characteristics. So, all the things they do around ferment time, um, the malting of their barley, the type of shape of spill, uh, the cut points, or, or how intense they make that whiskey. Um, the level of peat, that all comes off the distiller's new make spirit. Um, and once we get it to the barrel, it's kind of a line in the sand. The distillery's work is, is almost done. And then it's up to the time and the location and the type of wood that we mature it in that takes over and gives us all that color and flavor. Now, it's just a trade-off. You can't keep adding more wood flavor to whiskey and not slowly drift away from your distillery characteristic or what makes your whiskey yours. So, I mean, I guess... If you take every single distillery in Scotland and drink their eight-year-old whiskey, and then you drank all their two hundred-year-old whiskey, that all tastes pretty much the same because it's just going to be full wood flavour. So, part of that curve of slowly, um, you start moving away towards towards the barrel just takes ownership of the flavour of that whiskey. Um, Lafroy, we do a really good job of combating that a little bit through, as I said, refill or second fill cast. So, the final maturation of this twenty-five-year-old is a is a second fill or a refill. Um, Spanish oak, Oloroso sherry. So you get in that lovely fruit and spice in there. But rather than leaving it in seven years of first fill sherry and just making it a massive sherry bomb that you couldn't even tell was Lafroy, it's just subtly adding to that flavor. So we still do have, um, it drinks like a beautiful, nicely heavily peated Lafroy 18 with a beautiful seasoning of sherry rather than sort of that massive sherry bomb hit. Still plenty of like that Lafroy character on the nose. Yeah. It doesn't taste car strength to me. That's crazy. No, for 51.4, it's so smooth. Yeah. If you drank too much of that, you'd be wasted. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you drank too much of that, it would be wasted. Yeah. Well, this is true. So, brings me to another piece. If anybody is driving from a friend's house tonight, please don't. Yeah, don't drive. But that's yeah. it. And this this is one of the advantages to our <laughs> virtual tastings is everyone is at home. They don't have to go out. And they don't have to come back. And they can relax and not have to worry I'm about I'm close it. to home. Close to home, yeah. Not too bad. Well, I have a place where I sleep, but I think the shop's home. <laughs> some of us have a driver as well. So. Oh. <laughs> That's right. Some, some can't drive. Yeah. Oh. It's not my fault, but it's a medical condition. <laughs> Where's the guitar? Um, I'm a mad, <laughs> big, big fan of that. That's fantastic. So Beautiful, right? So uh, I, Peter I have Wright a sneaky well. suspicion that might be the favourite, but we'll see how we go. So yeah, Peter writes as well. It um, annoys him how great that was um, for his wallet. So, oh, sorry, it's not really going to be that good for his wallet. So, we can definitely help you out there, Pete. So, let us know. Which Pete? Uh, no, Pete Noakes. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's not the other one. No, not the other one. <laughs> uh, we can help him out too, though. <laughs> <laughs> Liquorlegends.com.au. Choose Canberra's <laughs> history. <laughs> race all over <laughs> love your work uh, so guys the next the next one we'll have a look at is the, the 27 year old um, so in 2015 to celebrate uh, 200 years of, of distilling um, we launched a campaign called Opinions Welcome um, we know Lafroy is one of the biggest boldest uh, but most polarising whiskies in the world uh, we say love us or hate us you're hooked for life um, and yeah like we did a campaign where we gave everyone their first taste of a Lafroy 10 year old and just viewed their initial reaction. And it's pretty funny to see like the different wide ranging opinions on it. Um, and, and yeah, we, we love that it's polarizing. We're never going to apologize or change for it. I think that's what brings Lafroy fans together as well. It's just such an intense whiskey. Since then, what we started to do is do some real premium releases. So in 2016, we did the Lafroy 32, uh, which was fairly 
cherry dominant. Um, it was it was first and um, first fill and, and refill sherry cup uh, and really intense. And in fact, our oldest release we'd ever we'd ever done. Um, then we did in 2017. We then did a, a 30 year old, which was much more American whiskey focused with some um, first and second fill and, and um, brand new American oak cast as well. Um, and then our third release in that series going down in age was the, the 27. Um, so quite an interesting whiskey, uh, the 27. Um, you've got a predominantly uh, refill ex-bourbon cast base. Um, so again, using that second fill to make sure we keep that Lafroig there. Um, and then there's a combination of refill quarter cast um, and ex-bourbon barrel there as well. So it's all American oak, um, but just obviously the quarter cast drives the whiskey out a lot, much more intense wood aging happening in that smaller size. Um, the refills in both the, the bourbon um, barrel and the quarter cast keep that smoke coming through. And then there is that beautiful big hit of fruit that you get from having um, the brand new X bourbon barrels. Um, and as I said, all X, X makers mark barrel as well. Um, this one, 41.7. So it comes in a really cool box. Yes, it does. Very cool. All that series comes in, in beautiful white boxes as well. So They do now. The 25 now comes in that as well. <clears throat> You'll notice on the nose, we've lost that kind of that deep, richest sweetness and that sort of um, dried fruits and stone fruits and spice that we have with that sherry coming from the 25. And it's gone much more back to big on the vanillas and the honeys, big on the citrus and, and the spice is a lot more dried out, more like cardamom and star anise and stuff like that. And then to me, the smoke comes through. I know it's a bit older, but the smoke for me is a bit bigger in the, in the 27 than the 25. It's so easy to drink. Such a sweet finish. Just big notes of, of vanilla rolling through from all that American oak. Yeah. Uh, John, Pete wants to know, you delivered to, the, to Brisbane. Yeah, no, I just um, replied back to him. I was like, we do, yes. We get, I we said it in person. Oh, I'd love to do it in person. <laughs> it's just a uh, <laughs> quick delivery that'll take me four weeks to self-quarantine each time I go up there, you know. <laughs> Oh, what a shame. Get yeah. yourself a nice hotel room overlooking the river. <laughs> Want to be a good order. I'll do it. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See you, Brady. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on my way. That was fantastic. Big fan of that one as yeah. well. I think for me, the 25 probably still. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, the sherry cast. Yeah. yeah the. Mm. I am a big fan of sherry and port cast finishes and that sort of thing, but um, the 25 was amazing, especially for 51%. Um, we've definitely had that come through a few times, so people can't believe it's a cast strength and how um, yeah, how smooth it is. Yeah. I actually found the um, this one to actually have a somehow slightly rougher mouthfeel. I don't really know how to describe that. It's not that it's not smooth. It's just, I don't know. Seems a bit bit bigger. And it's, it's yeah. really interesting you say that, Brady, because like these are extremely hard to get hold of now because mm. the 27 was released uh, a few years ago yeah. and over the years they've basically disappeared. Um, so we've been very, very lucky to be able to secure some of these to be able to give to your customers, which is actually quite cool. No, it's awesome. I'm a big yeah, fan. Yeah, 2018, guys. There's not a lot of floating around. If, if you do manage to get your hands on it and put it in the collection, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the only one they've done. So just, wait, really cool. just wait on that one. I've got one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so when, when you're saying that sort of more roughness of mouthfeel, for me, that's really the quarter cask. It, it, it does such a massive hit of, I guess, kind of drying out that finish. You've got so much of that vanilla floating around from that American oak. Um, dries out that finish and it adds a big hit of wood flavor. Um, we always say, even if you just look at the regular Lafroy quarter cast, we say that like they're not the most powerfully in terms of the, the smoke or, but they are the most robust or almost like muscular in terms of flavor. They're just really big and grippy whiskies that kind of roll through. The quarter cast really does just add an oomph of, of wood and weight and, and tannin to the palate as well. Like it just makes those whiskies feel bigger in the mouth. <laughs> It's actually um, really nice. I love this one. That's actually better than 25 as far as I'm concerned. So this is probably the Mac Daddy of the evening that we're holding is, is the newest release um, for this year, which is the Ian Hunter 30-year-old, the Ian Hunter series. 
um, comes with the Ian Hunter book and it's going to be a whole series. Um, 46.7%. Um, so some of you might be like, who's Ian Hunter? Basically, Ian Hunter um, was the last of the, the family line to own or, or manage the Lafroig distillery. Um, so Ian and Donald Johnson started in 1815 and for 139 years, it was, it was run by the family line. Um, and Ian Hunter was the last of those. Uh, he handed over in 1944 to Betsy Williams, who was the first actually ever female distillery manager. Um, some of you might have seen the law. Um, the law kind of talks about passing on secrets or passing down um, a tradition or a law that's kind of like passed on from generation to generation rather than written in the stone. So um, that, that passing from him to her was a bit of a sharing of secrets. And Ian Hunter really tipped the cap to the last man to not only finish that family lineage, but to pass it on to an outsider who was a very, very talented woman in, in Betsy Williams. Um, she actually came across to the distillery from, from Glasgow. Um, Ian had rung a friend and said he needed a clerk, someone who was good with admin and typing. And, and she'd been um, working as a, I guess, a shipping clerk in, in uh, Glasgow. And she came across to work at the distillery and just fell in love with whiskey and the whole process. And by the time he wrapped up in 1944, she was the, the obvious choice to be steward of the, of the distillery. Um, and yeah, did an amazing job. And it was, it was even Betsy who started to think about playing with some of the different double maturations and stuff like that that we see today that led to the quarter and the triple. So definitely a really significant time in the distillery's history. Um, but this series is, is really a tip of the cap to Ian Hunter, who, who kind of took the whiskey global as well and, and, and made it um, a, a world-renowned whiskey and, and put Peter Whiskey as a single malt kind of, I guess, for us, very much on the map. He was, he was really instrumental in doing that. So um, a bit of a tip of the cap to Ian Hunter. Um, and the 30-year-old, this one, is just 100% um, beautiful American Oak X bourbon Banker's Mark Cup. So it's 30 years old, um, but it's just embodies everything that the 10 does. Um, and it's just got all that big smoke. It's just been softened and lengthened out. It's going to have lovely sort of um, tangerine and lemon underneath that big smoke. It's going to be sort of a little bit buttery. It's going to have lovely vanilla rolling through the back. Um, just a phenomenal, phenomenal whiskey. This and is what I've been waiting for. I haven't tried it yet, so I hope uh, I'm halfway close to, to what I said, but we'll see how we go. <laughs> so for, for all those people out there, this is actually the first of 15 books. So over the next few years, you're going to turn and see a whole bunch of books being released. This is the actual first of all the books being released. So, yeah, this is actually quite special because uh, when John and I was talking about this entire night, we're just talking about the old 30-year-old, not the actual Ian Hunter. Um and Ian Hunter was the one that we actually came out. So I think John's got one bottle. Is that correct, John? Yeah. Yeah, we've still got one bottle left. So we can move on that if anyone's keen. I'm almost... I think Pete might be. Yeah, well, that, it is almost I'm, 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 almost. I'm, I'm dying to, but I'm just. <clears throat> this is probably the one that, out of all the whiskeys that we had tonight, I've been waiting for. Mm. I don't think I'm going to be um, disappointed. Can I get an advance? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have any bottles left, but Brady's working, <laughs> Brady's working every Saturday and Sunday now. For <laughs> the, rest, the rest of the year for free. <laughs> I'll, even work, I'll, I'll work Christmas Day for you. Yeah. I know I normally don't, but I'll, I will. Miss. Hey, Cam, that's absolutely special. That's yeah. amazing. I'm having trouble splitting my favourite out of the Lafroix. I'm not going to lie. Go back to a little comparison, but we were we were discussing a, a whiskey that we had on tasting. I won't say the brand, but it was a, a high calibre whiskey, and a lot of people sort of went, "Eh, it's kind of dull," and I I disagreed in that it was. The, the flavor line was so flat, you had to work really, really hard to pull it all apart. Um, and that, that can be quite hard work. Whereas I'm just finding with this, it's just all there and it's in your face and it slaps you around and it's Lafroig and it's sensational. It's, it's bigger than the 25. Yeah, it's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. I was going to save some for the staff, but no. <laughs> that, that's up there. That seriously is up there with the, the Cardis. Cast strength 15. 
Yeah, it's that it's that big old old um, ex bourbon barrel. Um, it's it's definitely a lot bigger than the last thirty year old as well. I actually, I think that's probably the most robust. More than the, I think the twenty seven was probably the easier drinking of the three, and then the twenty five, and then the thirty is like it's just big. It's right up in your face. Hallelujah. I'm converted. Yeah. <laughs> if someone's buying, I'm converted. But yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> no, that was the funny thing about yeah. it. The funny thing about it, John, is that that alone is all this combined tonight. If you were to buy that in a bar, oh, if you were buying, able to buy it in a bar, yeah, we spoke about that as well. And yeah. funnily, I was out last night um, in Civic and looking through the um, their whiskey list, and yeah, they had nothing like this um, even on their list. And let alone, so one thing you've got to be able to find it, and if you can find it, you'd be paying well over two hundred or. Three hundred dollars for you know thirty mils of it. So um, you did yeah, a very popular one for us. We do, as I said in the beginning, we've got a couple of kits left, um, but yeah, we'll box them up and we'll move them through. And great Father's Day present, or um, you know, another fantastic way to try, you know, some amazing, amazing whiskies, obviously. So yeah, very, very, very happy to be able to be even be able to do it. So I'd only tried two of these whiskies before. Uh, tonight, so yeah. so John, do you have the actual book there, or is it over at Hawker? No, the book's actually at Hawker at the moment. I'm sorry. So uh, for for those people that haven't seen the um, the Ian Hunter series or the book that we're talking about and the chapter, so book number one is actually in a it's not a box, it's actually in a sleeve that opens up, and the you actually open it up and it's a book, and the bottle is actually cut into that specific book. There's a whole section about Ian Hunter and what it's all about and Lafroy, just the story itself. So, again, this goes down that track of where we are, what we've been doing over the last 200 plus years, which is just amazing, uh, which is something that I just think is, I'm over the moon tonight. It's great. I, I have a, a massive, I've got over 19 different bottlings of Lafroy in my bar. Um, I don't have this one, but. I'm looking for it now. Mm. Well, the, when, yeah, it, when it actually a massive came thanks in, to that. Yeah, when when the Ian Hunter came in, one of the things that struck me is like I whack a bottle on a shelf and it looks nice, and I was racking my brains as to the packaging was that phenomenal. How do I actually show off the packaging yeah. as well? Yeah. You know, and and it's very difficult to do that. You can go, yeah, beautiful cabinet that you have, awesome limited whiskey, but you should see the packaging as well. That beautiful cabinet that you have behind you yeah but you can't open it up and go check this you know <laughs> so people are loving that but we just sort of go back and um yeah so this ian, ian hunter is amazing uh for 30 years old from the first smell i couldn't hold couldn't hold oh, sorry i couldn't <coughs> hold back my o um <laughs> nice. 30 years delicious well i didn't expect that so yeah, what is what is um everyone's favourite there? So I mean, it's obviously two very very different styles, Japanese, um, and then Isla. But I'm a big fan of the thirty, to be honest. But I'll probably still go back to the twenty five, to be honest. Yeah, I'm a massive massive fan of that. I could, yeah. Um, and Pete's pretty new to me, to be honest. Like for me, actually drinking it and been only drinking it. Oh. When I say new, it's probably the last five or six years. I've been getting better and better, but I could quite happily sit down now and drink those like extremely happily. And but yeah, definitely the twenty-five for me, to be honest. So Lucas is saying um two and six were his favourites. So oh, that's so the Hakashu and the uh, Lafroy uh, Ian Hunter. So no, that'd be the Yamazaki. Yamazaki Ian Hunter. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. Well, maybe we put them down in the wrong order then. It's possible. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, um, uh, yeah. he's, he's a ringer. Oh, <laughs> right. <-o. laughs> and he's had six nips. <laughs> or dram. Just to, just to uh, back up what you guys were saying. Uh, almost, almost impossible. I mean, probably impossible to find any of these whiskeys for less than about 100 bucks and they in a bar. And, and for the Lafroy's, you're looking at at least 150 to 200. So um, if you're looking for a good present for, 
for Father's Day. Um, well, I mean, I think if you don't go buy those remaining packs, you're mad as cut snake. I'd be ringing in tonight, putting my credit card down. But um, yeah, amazing whiskey. And, and thank you guys for, for cracking the bottles and doing them up and sharing them because good whiskey is for sharing. And it's amazing to see people getting an opportunity to try whiskey to this caliber um, in a set like that. Because I mean, if we had to go and individually buy those bottles, I'd have to put a second mortgage on my house, you know, it's like it's, it's awesome. So. Yeah, it was about six, just over six thousand dollars retail. Yeah, wow, um, wow. Yeah, when, yeah. We, when we opened them up, so um, yeah, it, it seemed really odd. But walking, yeah, I'm sort of in the car and put down this box and think, oh, six and over six thousand dollars just in, you know, six bottles in one box sitting beside me. So, so you can imagine John me asking you to do this. Yeah, yeah. and look, it, it, it's as I said, well, we've been doing this now for three or four months, sort of on and off. Yeah. Um, every second week. So, yeah, from where we started out to be able to do this and yeah. be able to get, you know, 25 people, um, you know, 25 packs sold and 25 people out there watching and, and loving it. So, um, it's amazing. It's amazing, yeah. man. I, so, no, up to you guys. Very grateful to be able to do it. And, um, yeah, Stoke, we're going to obviously going to continue on. So, um, just quickly on that, we've got in two weeks' time, we're doing a, a Four Pillars gym. Uh, then just after that, we're doing uh, a Talisker tasting. And then we've got a bit more coming up. Uh, and then we've got Maker's Mark coming up as well. So, so a bit of a teaser for everybody that's out there. So we have a bit more with a couple of really, really special releases that one doesn't exist anymore. And one's only just been released. Two, Maker's Mark and special guest. Yes. Which is awesome. Oh, hush, I'm here a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and in the background of all this, that those people who love the smoky whiskies, just keep an eye out. Yeah. There might be something really, really special coming. Yeah, so there's some more fantastic things coming. We're open to ideas as well, but the next sort of, probably the next six weeks, we're sort of taken up with, um, you know, we'll, we'll have a couple of um, week, week breaks. Uh, yes, as I said, the next one's in two weeks' time. But, yeah, we've got plenty coming up. So, no, so uh, they're, the they're always awesome. They're always awesome. So, uh, yeah, to all the guys um, and to everyone who joined us tonight, thank you. Um, we're always spoiled with, with what the guys put on for us. But uh, to everyone who joined us on the call as well, thanks. Because uh, I remember where I was when I tried my first 25 in Ian Hunter and, and then you guys were with me. So, thanks. It's Absolutely. Awesome. That's awesome. That's one, of, that's one of the really cool things that, to be able to try and bring this to people that are out there um, enjoying tonight, it's it's really cool. So, John, Brady, thank you very much for all your support. Uh, mate, it's been a pleasure um, being able to do this tonight with you guys. And Cam, thank you. Mate, you're a legend. Oh, um, thank you. It's one of those things that as things evolve around what's going on, um, this is becoming the norm. Um yeah, so absolutely. it's how we turn and evolve from here. So, guys, please watch out. What we're doing is all it's going to do is get better. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, yeah, look forward to the next one. So, but that was, look, yeah, I'm, I'm still raving. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I still reckon you turn and stole my idea for my fantastic. birthday. Sorry. You stole my idea for my birthday. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't you only 50, not 135? Or... <laughs> <laughs> oh, two of you together, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Now I'm an old ranger. Thanks, John. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, oh, we didn't yeah, mention the glasses in there as well. So it's fantastic to end up with a nice glass. We did have a couple of people asking, um, yeah, where the chocolates were and the food matching, but as we, we spoke about that as well. And we just thought we'll just let, you know, there's some amazing whiskies. We'll just let the whiskey do the talking just, yeah, with a nice clean palate. And um, also guys, no one's ever stopping you from up. bringing Chucky and whiskey to your own whiskey taste. It's fine. Like these will pair. Um, I mean, if you want some recommendations, guys, that the Yamazaki loves the sweeter style of thing. Um, if you're looking for cheeses, go sort of, I guess, like think towards your, your breeze and stuff like that. And, and your Chucky definitely goes with your Japanese whiskey. But for that LaFoy, Think like hard cow's milk cheese, like like cheddars and comtes, and and those robust styles of cheeses go go amazingly. Um, yeah, but definitely like just because we didn't do the pairing for you tonight doesn't mean you can't 
um, dive into the fridge and get some meats and some cheeses and stuff and, and go to town. So that definitely works. Absolutely. Hopefully some people have still got some um, some of the samples left. <laughs> so, um, and, and they haven't smashed their Riddell glasses. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, thank you very much, guys. Um, really appreciate it. We've got a, lots of yeah great comments coming through again. So, um, yeah, uh, we can't say it. We say it every week, but yeah, I can't thank you enough for it. And, um, nah, very, thanks, very guys. Nice doing it. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Cheers, thanks, guys. guys. Thanks, so right. much. Have a great Take care. Have have thank you. Enjoy. Thanks, Michael. See you, mate. See you See all you. at the Bamal night in a few weeks' time. Um, trust me, it's going to be worth it. Absolutely. I'll be yeah. there. Cheers, guys. <laughs> See, See you, guys.